Now, Omar is a native of Jordan, and he lives here in uh, Ottawa with his wife, Zainab, and uh, two girls, aged five and two. Uh, he's, Omar is a software engineer, and he's a graduate of the uh, Philadelphia University in Jarish in Jordan. He's going to talk to us about, about uh, tonight about computer, some computer definitions, a little bit of software history, and where uh, Omar is employed is at Prime Choice Auto Parts, and perhaps tell us a little bit about the application of software to his particular responsibility. So, Omar, well, thank you, uh, <coughs> thank you, Ed, for uh, the introduction and. Uh, Welcome everyone. Uh, I wasn't expecting that many people here. <laughs> okay. So as uh, Ed mentioned, I'm, I'm gonna, my my uh, my presentation is going to be uh, about uh, so computers in general. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about softwares, hardwares, uh, some high level definitions. Uh, they some history behind the software programming and languages. Uh, software lifecycle and uh, some software roles and last is uh, my field at work yep. so what I do how I do it and after that will be if you guys have any questions I guess okay uh, so okay <clears throat> Definitions. Uh, I'll start with some high-level definitions. Uh, and please, if anyone has any questions, please let me know and feel free to interrupt me. Uh, so what is a computer? Or how does a computer look like? So many of you guys just think that the computer is just a desktop or a laptop. Actually, no. The computer could be anything else. So uh, a computer can be an iPad or, or a phone or a actually your home appliances like washer or like dryer or dishwasher or anything or the smart TVs are actually computers. Uh, even your car have a computer chip inside it, so it is a computer. Anyway, so uh, computers, despite of their type, they consist of two major elements, so hardware and the software. Uh, the hardware is the collection of physical parts. So anything you can physically touch is called hardware. Uh, so it's some examples of a hardware. It could be like the case, the, the, the monitor, the screen, the keyboard, the mouse, anything, basically. Uh, moving to the computer software is a, the, the set of instructions to perform a specific operation. Uh, so, for example, this this presentation it's uh, made through a PowerPoint, and the PowerPoint is a software. So here we go. We are using a software right now. Uh, your iPad, your phone, it does have applications. So your applications are software. Uh, so. Uh, and then we do have software development, which is my field, which is the computer programming, documenting, testing, and bug fixing, fixing, resulting in a product and a software product. So meaning that the software product is the end result of a, a software development. Uh, and probably you. So the, uh, the bugs in here, so any failure that happens in a software, we call them bugs. Uh, bugs can be errors, failures, or unexpected uh, results, basically. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So uh, a software is developed, so the software product is developed by using a programming language. And that brings here that the program, programming language is a set of keywords designed to communicate instructions to a computer. So programmers, one of their responsibilities is to code uh, using a, a programming language and uh, tell the hardware what to do, kind of. 
Uh, okay, so speaking about programming languages, there is hundreds and hundreds of different programming languages. Uh, many probably will focus on the computer performance, uh, others design different methodologies, uh, hundreds of different types. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, I am a, a, a trilingual, so I speak three languages, uh, and that's not counting the, the programming languages. <laughs> okay, uh, so here are some examples uh, about programming languages. Uh, happened to just selected five of those, just because those are the ones I deal with on a daily basis, I guess. So HTML, which is a very basic one, uh, SQL or SQL, Java, JavaScript, C Sharp, Visual Studio. And that's just a few examples of programming languages. There is many, many other programming languages out there that probably few people would use. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about uh, some history. Uh, again, probably I had a chat with uh, John uh, before the, the meeting and probably he would know much, much more than what I'm gonna explain right now or talk about. Uh, so first of all, in, in the 1940s, uh, oh, is that a button? <laughs> no, he hit the black button. Yeah. So in the 1940s, first computers were created. So for those computers, they were using assembly languages. And assembly, assembly languages are just machine language. So uh, they're very tough to learn, very hard uh, to understand, I guess. Uh, yeah, so they were uh, low-level programming languages, and they had limited speed and uh, memory, uh, like limited memory capacity. So in the 1950s, uh, high-level programming languages came and uh, they were easier to program. Uh, so they were easier to program and uh, well the, the only problem is that those programming languages in the 1950s uh, were actually the way they ran is uh, well, they were easier because they were using some, some understandable keywords. So instead, well, every time they run the program or the software, the, 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 uh, the computer, the programming languages, translate that to machine language every time they try to run the computer. So it was very low, slow, uh, slower performance. Uh, however, in the good side, it was an easier uh, way to program computers. After that, uh, in the mid-50s, uh, we start using compilers. And compilers, actually, uh, they automate the translation from the, the programming languages to machine language. Uh, so it was easier. They solved the, the problem uh, uh, with the performance, computer performance. Uh, so after that, in uh, the 60s to late 70s, uh, all the other programming languages start to appear and, and they were much better in, in compilers, uh, so they were fixing or modifying the, the performances. Uh, it was easier, better performance, better compilers. Uh, then, and 1980s, they were focused more on on the modules and performance. Uh, and actually, they were focused on the large scale uh, systems. Uh, then, in in the 1990s, we had the internet, which is the internet age, or or when the internet became public to everyone. Uh, so the, the, the programming languages back then, uh, they were focused on, on growth, uh, productivity, uh, the appearance, 
uh, probably web browsers, so they were aiming for, for online stuff uh, or internet, interact with the internet. Then in the uh, 2000s, uh, the evolution uh, came. So uh, probably people were, were focused on perform uh, sorry, in, in communication, uh, mobility, so can I access my data anywhere? Uh, security is my data safe outside or out there? Uh, support, am I getting uh, the, the support support I need? If I, if I happen to change my, my program, is it easy to, to change? Uh, open source, so I, I need to be able to change my code. I need to, to see my code, what, what I'm doing. Uh, probably some, some changes will, will come in and I need to see the code so I can change it. Uh, then uh, all the other stuff came along like smart TVs, phones, so that's basically all software. Anyone have any question? I've got a lot, but I can't think of what I need. Don't even start. <laughs> okay, so that's just a timeline explaining in more details what were the programming languages. It's not clear, but just to give you an idea, it's from the 50s all the way to 2011. So different, hundreds of different programming languages. You know. Okay, so moving forward, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the software life cycle. And every time we decide to program or do a new project or a new software, we have to, to go through a, a, a process, a life cycle. So every software has a life cycle. Uh, the, the easiest one, or, or I would say the, the traditional one, is the waterfall development, which is the old, I would say the oldest, easiest one, probably. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm gonna talk about the waterfall development. There is other uh, development methodologies, probably some examples are, are the spiral development, rapid and agile development, which happen to be the one we I work with on a daily basis in my business or the place I work. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna go through uh, this list. Uh, so all starts with the requirements. Each software have different requirements, and and basically, uh, what should this system do? And uh, uh, so, what are the, the requirements? What is this software supposed to be doing? Then we we do move to uh, design. So we need someone to come and and design, structure the software. Uh, how does it look like or how should it look like? Um, uh, after that, there is uh, implementation. So that's, again, programming, coding. Uh, so that's code writing. Uh, after we're done with the, with, uh, with the coding step, we have to test our software. So we do test. Go ahead, John. No design. What is your medium of design? I mean, do you see a, a line of code, or do you see a, a map outline of a system? What is your vision that you're able to use to your design process? How do you get your requirements into a design? Right. So probably here the design could mean different things. So probably the, the code design, the structure, or the algorithm behind this code. So how are the way we should be doing it? Are we using different algorithm? Is that the correct algorithm? How we should design this structure? So that's the backend design. So that's not, nothing really visual. Uh, the other design, which probably what you mean is the graphic design or, or the websites, which is the new thing is is uh, we we bring it we bring up a, a designer a web designer uh, the one that just lay out the different you get theme a, you get a two dimensional or three dimensional layout two dimensional mm -hmm. yeah. 
I would not be surprised to have the third dimension any light. So that's, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Oculus is producing the third dimension. Okay. Cool. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions, Joe? No, I just want to get a handle on the design. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to just really get my thing done. That's a question. Because I work with you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand that fourth one down. Testing. <laughs> Is that a theoretical one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we do lots of testing where we work. And we don't do any testing. <laughs> right. <laughs> Is he a product tester? No. <laughs> so, testing. We need to test the software before going public. That means that we need to test uh, bugs. We need to validate the code if it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, validate, so can we enter a number where, uh, like text or like the other way around? Can we, uh, I don't know. Uh, not write your name where the age is, probably. Right, not just that it behaves properly with the correct data, but it behaves reasonably with incorrect data. Exactly, yes. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and then, after testing and making sure everything is good and it's ready to go public, we do the deployment or installation. That phase is the final software product. So when everything is ready, we put it live. So in case of, of websites, which actually they're software, uh, we, we put it online. Uh, and if it's like an application or a system, we install it in the client computer. So different deployments. And then the maintenance come, which probably if anything changes, uh, if we found some bugs that came, uh, some defects in this software, uh, the maintenance come and that's why we have different versions of, of software. So, uh, for example, Windows 8, we had Windows 8, then after four months, we had Windows 8.1, which is a new version. Probably they fixed some security or bugs or defects. Could be anything. So, just because I mentioned uh, agile uh, programming, uh, just a quick look here at the Agile development. It's more about uh, adaptive planning, uh, so uh, evaluationary development, fast delivery, continuous improvement, and rapid, flexible response to change. So basically what that means is we have to move very fast. We have too many different projects. And we have to go through that very quickly and uh, have outcomes very quickly. So at this point, we really don't care about much testing, and that's what our problem is, uh, just because we have a continuous improvement. So even though if, if our software have some defects, we actually care about the, the improvement. That's kind of what it is, and, and the reason why we're doing that is just because we have probably too, too many projects that need to be done yesterday. And, uh, and that's the way it should. Or that's the, the better way of development. Any questions? Yes, yeah, so Omar. If I'm a hacker, on your waterfall picture that you had previously, how am I attacking your design? Uh, you're attacking the implementation, so the code. You're ruining my code. And, so they, and they can psych that out by indirectly keying in in some way? So the, the implementation, so probably a part of, of design is designing the database. The database is where everything, your probably secure information is. We put it in a database. And then a, an interface to that database is the implementation, so the code. So you'll have a secure page interfacing with your database. 
So a hacker can go into your machinery and bring out your implementation plan? Exactly. So not your implementation. Implementation is just uh, like the front end. They want to go back to the back end where your data is. So a hacker would come and just go through the codes uh, till he finds the data he wants or just ruin your website or application. Uh, a smart way is just to create backups and once you get hacked, just do your backup, you restore your backup and you'll be fine unless you have valuable information just like banks or accounts or money or whatever. That's a different story. So they have a more advanced security system or what we call firewalls just to block those hacks. In 1950 and 60, we had to do backups every 24 hours. What is the cycle now? It depends really. So where I work, we could have backups every five minutes and up to every 24 hours. Really depends what you're trying to do. Yeah, there's several databases, uh, and the really vital ones get backed up, you know, like Omar said, every five minutes. But other ones that don't get used as much get backed up every day. Although most of them get backed up every hour incrementally, and then we do a full backup right. every 24 hours. Yeah, the most reasonable way is every hour, I guess. So that's the average. Actually, larger ba databases that banks use, are, it's dynamic. Yeah. You update the database, there's a backup made right away, Another. and then if somebody comes in to hack yeah. the one, then you've only lost transactions for about right. a minute. Right. So your, your backup is, a, is about a minute old. And we, we started doing mirroring net very recently yeah. to take care of things like that. Yeah. We didn't like it too technical. <laughs> So recently, I moved to a different position. So I used to be a programmer. Uh, let me go back two more steps here at the life cycle. So what I'm, uh, I forgot to mention here uh, that every step of these are actually could be potentially a different role and a different responsibility. So we could have a, a, a person who does uh, the analysis and requirements. So, and we could have a person who does only the, the design and structure. We could have only implementer or programmer and tester or QA quality assurance. Uh, so it really depends on, on which company or how big or budget limited is that company. That's how they divide the, the roles. And most likely, us as software developers, we actually go through all these steps. So it takes only one person, and unless probably the graphic design, which a completely different field. However, as a warning, the person that does the design and implementation should not be the person doing the testing. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, I moved to a different position or a higher position, which is a software development manager. Uh, and this position actually oversees all the previous steps of any software cycle. So uh, one of my responsibilities is to oversee the development steps or life cycle. Uh, I have to, to plan, schedule, uh, lead the projects or the software projects. Uh, so make sure everyone is on track, especially with the agile development. I have to make sure everyone is is putting or like getting everything that they should be doing. Uh, other other stuff I have to do is just basically assist my uh, my team, be there for whenever they need, uh, even help them develop or program uh, so anything they, they want because end of the day basically my my own success as a manager is is my team's success so if my team is successful I will be eventually successful and uh, that's about it I hope uh, I got it right so any questions so
What kind of uh, programs do you create for your business for automobile parts? Like, what, right. what kind of different types of programs do you do? Okay, so uh, high level uh, intro. We we are a, a, a warehouse uh, for auto parts, so we sell auto parts, uh, or we manufacture auto parts, and then we store them in our warehouse. Uh, Ninety percent of our business is actually online businesses or e-commerce. Uh, that means that we sell our products online through eBay, through different channels. Examples are eBay, Amazon, Canada, US. All around the place. So, uh, my my type or the, the software behind that that we have softwares or servers uh, have engines. Engines are softwares basically that they don't have any design or anything, any visual, any any visuality, uh, but they do run twenty four seven just to catch competitors and data. And we look for uh, who sells just like ours, our parts. Uh, who, uh, How's their sales? Can we compete them? Uh, do we have enough margin? Uh, probably we are interested to uh, bring something like a different category. Is it a good category to, to bring? Is it worth it? Uh, is any money coming out? That's the main uh, backbone of the business. Other softwares is the WMS, which Steve is responsible, uh, which is the warehouse management system. So that happens to be the purchasing, uh, uh, where should we store the, uh, the different items, SKUs, parts, packages, so. It's inventory management then. Sorry? Yes. Inventory management? Yes. So are you, you're selling auto parts? Uh, yes, we manufacture auto parts. Uh, that's the warehouse. But, but you're in the computer business. Yes, so, yeah. Uh, so we do have uh, different sections or different departments. One of those are the IT department, which uh, probably were six developers uh, with the database and yeah, we can't yeah. count you. You don't do that, anymore, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> right? Uh, so yeah, as as I mentioned, because we sell auto parts. The actual auto. This is an auto part. Sell that? No, auto parts like your car needs a, a light, a headlight. Yes, so you sell auto so parts. So we sell auto okay. parts. So but I need a headlight, I'll go to you. Yes. No. Okay, so what's this computer stuff? Then? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so because we sell those auto parts online, so through the internet, so we need a, a, a programming language to push them out there. Start at the beginning again and tell them what to do. <laughs> yes, Ed. Well, what's so what's so unique? I, I assume you have competitors in this industry. So, uh, what is so unique about you as opposed to you know the three or four other major vendors of auto parts? Why would you have to have a sort of a unique programming component to manage your your business? Right. So, so just because uh, the people behind the warehouse they had long experience with auto parts and probably pricing and margins and all this kind of stuff, so they came up with with a formula. Uh, by this formula, they believe that they can maximize their sales online, uh, and that's what we do. For example, just to give you an example. If, if a, a brake pad, a competitor sells it for, let's say, $20, and our cost is $12, we have this formula, so uh, we say, for example, if we have 15% margin, we're okay to, to go uh, below the lowest competitor by 1%, for example. That's one, one formula that's out there. Uh, so we're always, most likely, we're one, 1% lower than the lowest. That's why our systems are constantly running overnight, 24-7, just to capture new data and new, new people coming in on board just to get their prices, get their sales. Uh, are they selling within this, for example, a brick wrapper $20, are they selling? Do they have sales? If not, probably their price is wrong. 
do they have 200 sales? Okay, that's probably a, a good price. So we should be below than one percent, one percent, or one cent, or whatever the formula is. So there is different techniques, and then we do have the the marketing department, which they go out there and just kind of study what our competitors doing. So, for example, there could be having different images or like attractive titles or different backgrounds or uh, multiple pictures. So, it's all about marketing these these things happen to. All your I hope you I answered your question. Omar, first do all of your competitors have the right to your data? The data, just like I mentioned, is out there. So anyone can take a look at the data, can see everything. It's public. Uh, it's public. public, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Now, other than we do have private data, no one can look into that. But other than that, yes, it's all the data is public. So, so our private data would be what we pay for and they don't have access to that. But everything that we sell is up on the website at a price. Yeah, and so everybody can see that. That's right. So for example, the cost of our parts, this is private, no one can see that. However, our sales transactions, that's public, anyone can see that. And your paycheck, is that private too? <laughs> <laughs> that's too small. <laughs> it doesn't fit on the computer. <laughs> Do you do retail or is it just uh, no, uh, to yes, sell we, to other? Yeah, we do, mainly we do wholesale, so it's probably 80 to 90% is online sales. Then we have some retail stores uh, around the city. So okay. we have two, three. Wait, what do you mean by retail? Like we well, sell, like we if do, I want to buy some spark plugs, so I put it Yeah, <laughs> we, we sell to consumer. Um, but 90, 99% of our sales are to consumer, one or two parts. Occasionally, we'll do a big sale of several thousand dollars to a garage, or, uh, and that, that would be a yeah. sale. But we do have a retail store. A yeah. small uh, garage? Yeah. I mean, I'm not buying a car park. I'm buying car parts. For yeah, small like garages? Or you? you I like all the yeah, <laughs> there, there is a huge, huge market for car parts. Yeah, oh, sure. Do you, do you feel comfortable in giving some numbers? Share some uh, numbers? Yes, actually, on eBay alone, on daily basis, for the past week, we're doing $125,000 a day. And that's the type of sales we're doing on daily basis. And that's from one channel only. We, we typically do between 45 and 50 million a year. Yes. And, and we're not number one. And there is so much room out there for anyone that <coughs> wants to do this. Well, there must be consulting firms out there that have a product on the shelf that does exactly what you guys are doing in Germany. Is that true? True. Canadian Dryer, is that just a consulting firm? No, there'll be consulting organizations that know their, their games and can sell them a product right off their shelf can do what they want to get done. We always do have a cap, so we can't go below a certain number, and we can't go above a maximum, uh, a certain number. So if it happened to, there is room for everyone in that market, especially in you know, eBay, there is room for everyone. So everyone is making sales, everyone is happy with their sales, and we're just uh, some small company out there. Uh, some consultants. <laughs> so are you talking about like some office well, I'm software? I'm imagining that there are consulting organizations that know that there are a lot of people out there selling auto parts. Right. So they could say, well, we have a program that we design. We'll sell it to you. And you can do your part management with this program. Right. There, there are warehouse management systems. There are storefronts um, that would handle different things right. like that. Um, it's that cheaper to do it in the house. What do you got? Price. Do we get the penny? The company gets a better deal. It, it usually is a lot cheaper at this stage. If they were to start over today, it would be cheaper 
for them to go and buy it off the shelf. They would redevelop. Right. Our, our programs are millions of lines of code at this point. And you guys built it all? It's been, yes. We Through? Yeah. I haven't built it all. He hasn't built it all, but <laughs> somebody has. But the software people in the company, or they hired some contractors to come and sure. build it all. This is the step where maintenance comes. So if anything new or a new feature comes in, we just add it and keep adding it and making the software bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and we're making it better because there was a lot of stuff that was put in, like he said before, it was just put in and it wasn't really tested that well. And then it breaks later on when something else came. So. Yes, sir. I think Magna, I gather they're one of the larger manufacturers of auto parts in the country. Do you buy from them and sell their product? Or do you manufacture competing products with their lines? Yes, so we do manufacture our own parts, and that's uh, China, just because that's how the market is. <coughs> uh, so Gary, which is the president, uh, uh, just uh, we want uh, uh, this part and he buys it from a competitor sends it to China and he says I want exactly like this part so we we buy I don't know like seven eight months worth of inventory and we put it in our warehouse uh, larger uh, quantities bring the cost down and the shipping down and everything less value and that's how we actually compete with other competitors. So they're aftermarket parts, and they're not the best out there. However, they're affordable. So you don't physically have a manufacturing plant. No. You are simply a, a broker from China or other places. How many items do you have in your system? SKUs, if that's what you mean. We have 38,000 SKUs different SKUs and unique parts. We have around 18,000 parts. So then we combine, for example, two, two brake pads is a pair of pads. So that's another SKU. Uh, a brake and a router is, a, is another package. So we create packages, different packages. And that's again with, with the, the marketing department. They see what the market or what the clients would probably look for, and that's how we create different packages. That's Omar, do you limit the year of autos? In other words, do you deal with antiques? Uh, to answer your question, the short answer is no, we don't. Uh, but there is a database that we purchase every two years, and that's basically every car that is running or drivable in, in the street. So I would say, I don't know, 80s, oldest, 90s? Maybe. So nothing in the 1910s or 1990s? No, no. Yeah, okay. I mean, 90s, yeah. No, this is, this is mass market. Yeah, okay. Any more questions? Ed? You can help or uh, experience denial of service online? Uh, complain to me? Yeah, get help. To hackers, we hate your site. Uh, we, we haven't gotten hacked. We have gotten attacked. Yes. Okay. So people are looking for information. So uh, one of probably the private data we do have is the cars that are out there, and the fi we call them fitments. So this brake pad fit uh, 2010 Toyota Camry, for example, and that's private data because we purchased that data. Uh, some people try to get this data, so that's hacking. They're trying to get private data. We have right. been attacked with fraud attempts. Or frauds, yes. So we had uh, last day uh, uh, an individual from Hawaii that purchased light bars for $20,000 in a stolen <coughs> credit card. <laughs> so we get those types. They're not hats, but they're attacks. Front. Any more questions? Thank you.